Welcome to the third section in our series on energy balance and obesity. In this section, which will be our longest section, is going to cover the calories in and calories out theory. And I'm going to start with what is a calorie. Now, I covered this earlier in the semester, but a calorie is simply a unit of energy. It's a unit of food energy. So when we look at a unit of measurement, we think of you know, an inch or a foot or a yard, and that's basically just a, a measurement of length. And the same thing when we look, a calorie is simply a measurement of food energy. So we have food going into our system, and from that, we will generate energy. We measure that energy in calories. The energy balance theory is, is simply looking at the amount of energy that from food and beverages going into our system and the amount of energy that we expend. And this is the thermal effect of food, which I'll explain in a minute. BMR is basal metabolic rate, and then our physical activity. So when energy in and energy out are equal, our weight remains stable. So when we think of energy in and energy out, we're thinking of calories in and calories out. So looking at the calories out side of the equation, this is energy expenditure. The greatest portion comes from our basal metabolic rate. Now our basal metabolic rate is essentially the metabolism, our general metabolism is the energy expenditure needed for all the unconscious activities that we have. We have to breathe and our heart's beating, we have to make enzymes and proteins, we are, are regenerating our tissues. So all of those factors that happen, all of the processes in our body that happen that we're not consciously thinking about, that's our basal metabolic rate. And that determines a large portion of how many you know, calories that we burn or essentially the energy expenditure. And there are many factors that actually affect basal metabolic rate, but um, very few that you can control. So we start with age. As we get older, usually the basal metabolic rate goes down. Now, part of this is related to a loss of lean mass because more muscle, which I'll talk about in a minute, is going to lead to more energy expenditure. Height. People who are taller and actually people who are larger have more surface area. That means more surface area actually to keep warm. You're going to be generating more heat, increasing your energy expenditure just because you're taller. Growth whether during pregnancy or childhood, um, anytime there is growth happening, even if you're building muscle through weightlifting, there's going to be greater energy expenditure because there are more tissues that need to be developed. And as I was just referring to body composition, so this is the amount of lean muscle mass that is actually correlated, greater lean muscle mass is correlated with greater energy expenditure because for every pound of muscle, it actually takes more energy just to keep that muscle going, doing everything it needs to do, even at rest compared to fat. And it's not as if fat just sits there, it actually is metabolically active, but not nearly as much as muscle. So the more muscle you have on the body, the more calories you will burn at rest. Uh, fever, any sort of sickness, illness, fever actually increases your basal metabolic rate. Stress will increase basal metabolic rate as well. Temperature. Colder temperatures actually require a greater basal metabolic rate because we usually, um, it's called a shivering thermogenesis, but you have to shiver or it takes energy to make you shiver to generate more energy. So you'll actually burn more in a colder climate. Starvation and malnutrition actually decrease basal metabolic rate. And this is interesting because when some people go on very restricted diets. It's actually as if the body thinks that starving is going into a food scarcity mode. It slows everything down. Okay, I'm going to do just what I have to do. So the basal metabolic rate goes down. And it almost tries to meet that calorie intake. So that's uh, one reason why sometimes it, it, even in a calorie restricted diet, which will lose weight, but you're not going to lose as much as, say, you know, if you calculated calories in versus calories out, if you went down to 600, 800 calories, you'd think you'd lose 
um, a dramatic amount of weight, but initially your body's going to slow down its rate to help compensate. Of course, anything prolonged, um, you know, you're gonna, you probably would end up losing weight, but your body knows how to compensate. It knew how to survive in times of food scarcity in the past, and so it still falls back to that. Thyroxine, so this is thyroid hormone. This is used by every cell in the body and it actually will increase metabolic rate. And you've heard of people who are hypothyroid, so they don't have enough thyroid, they're not secreting enough uh, thyroid and they actually have to take thyroid. Um, and if you're hypothyroid, usually you're a little bit heavier, heavier, you've gained weight. But once you receive the thyroid, this actually speeds up the metabolism and this is throughout all cells in the body. And then elevation, I thought I'd throw this in too, but higher elevation, the higher you are at elevation, the more um, energy you expend, just being at that elevation. Um, and then we also talked about temperature too. So remember the charts that I showed you earlier, how Colorado, kind of the last state uh, to really develop obesity, even though its obesity rates have doubled, is still the lowest in the nation. And I think it's Denver and Boulder, like the two lowest uh, obesity rates in the nation. While well, they have colder climates in the wintertime and they're at a higher elevation. And that is the proposed theory for why the state has the lowest rates of obesity. So the thermic effect of food. What exactly is the thermic effect of food? This is the energy it takes for us to break down our food. So remember, we have to digest our food, and then the food has to be absorbed, and then it's metabolized in order for us to utilize it as energy. And even though we think about all food contributing um, calories, and I'll go over this a little bit um, in a little bit, but remember, not all of our macronutrients contribute equal amounts of calories, and they also are metabolized differently. So different food combinations are actually going to provide a different thermic effect. Meaning you might, depending on the types of food you eat, you will burn more energy breaking down and utilizing those foods. Um, lastly, physical activity. I don't need to comment too much here, but as far as uh, this contributing to our overall energy expenditure, this is the activities or the exercises that we choose to do. And if we look at the breakdown, you can see how our BMR, our basal metabolic rate, is the largest component of this. And this is the one we have the least control over. So you might think, well, that's genetics, and it is to a certain extent. You're, you're born short or you're born tall, then, then, then that's part of it. Also, we all age, um, and you know, we have different climates that we live in. But the one aspect you can control is an indirect effect from physical activity. So the more physically active you are, the more lean muscle mass you have, and therefore the more you burn at rest, the more energy you need at rest just to keep that muscle going. Notice that there's a pretty big range for physical activity. Obviously, you may be a sedentary person. You might be sitting in front of the computer as I am right now instead of out mountain biking, which is an activity that I would choose to do, or maybe you play tennis or you run. Um, or maybe you are a mail carrier and you go door to door, so you're very active at your job. So all of those things will contribute to our physical activity, which is only a portion of our total energy expenditure or energy out. Lastly, we have the thermic effect of food. Remember, different foods are going to contribute to the thermic effect of food a little bit differently. And I will talk about this later. I want to talk a little bit about the calories in, calories out theory. And the idea is that if you take in fewer calories or energy from beverages and food, and you have a greater energy expenditure from activity, basic metabolic rate, and thermic effect of food, you're not going to change this one here, but maybe activity and the types of food you eat, uh, you're going to lose weight. So that's that's our, our theory. If you take in more energy or calories from food and beverages than you burn or you expend, then you will have weight gain. And this idea comes from the first law of thermodynamics, which is energy cannot be created or destroyed. And it only can change form. So the energy that we get from food is going to be utilized in our body 
will be given off as heat. So we have that utilization. We're going to use it for activities, for our unconscious activities to digest our foods. And if we have an equal amount, equal in, equal out, then we won't gain any weight. We take in too many calories, we don't burn as much, then you know, we're going to have weight gain as it shows here. Now this is the traditional way of looking at weight gain and weight loss. Now what I want to do is maybe point out some flaws in this theory. And this is based on um, some of the reading I've done from Gary Tobbs who wrote Good Car Calories, Bad Calories and Why We Get Fat. The idea is not that the first law of thermodynamics is not true because it is. The calories in should equal the calories out, but it's the idea of cause and effect. And right now, we think about it as if the cause is taking in too many calories or the cause is too few calories going out, so you're not burning enough. And the effect is gaining weight. So we have weight gain. So we have you eat too much, you exercise too little, you gain weight. Now, essentially that means you become larger. The idea is that the cause is eating too much, the effect is gaining weight or becoming larger. But let me ask you this question. Do children grow, grow larger because they're eating more? And when children grow, they eat more, right? And we know that all children grow. Or are they eating more because they're growing? And why are they growing? Are they eating more because of hormones? Well, hormones are what make children grow. And children are eating more because they're growing, not vice versa. They're not eating more and that's causing them to grow. They're growing because of hormones. So is it possible that people eat more because of hormones? So if you kind of flip this around and think of it as a hormonal imbalance is the cause, the effect is consuming too much food and the result is becoming larger. Now, this is more of a hormonal uh, theory of weight gain uh, or obesity. And prior to World War II, this actually was a more commonly believed theory. This is no one knew what was causing weight gain. Um, the, Germ the Germans actually had done a lot of research that thought that maybe it was a hormonal imbalance. Um, the idea of the first law of thermodynamics and cause and effect kind of took hold too. So there are two competing theories. But after the, uh, the war, uh, no one wanted anything to do with the Germans. And of course, a lot of their research and laboratories were probably destroyed. And a lot of that got lost. That theory got lost, the first law of thermodynamics, the idea that taking in too many calories and exercising too little caused uh, people to become larger. And that's our main theory now. And again, it's not that the first law of thermodynamics is not true. It's all about the cause and effect. So if people are taking in too much food, we have to think about why and how. And that's what I want you to think about. And if we look at this, I'm going to start with what I've been talking about all semester. And that is the idea that we find carbohydrates. Remember, this is our, our cereals and grain products and pastas and all that processed food, refined grains. Um, can cause a hormonal imbalance. And I'm going to review this from our carbohydrate chapter. Remember that if you take in a refined carbohydrate, and let's just say a bagel, and this is our, you know, our blood glucose, this represents glucose right here, that when you take that in, that is a very highly digestible starch. It's very easy to digest. And boom, it gets absorbed and the blood sugar spikes. So this is all the blood sugar. And it goes up. The response from the pancreas is to release insulin and it's going to have to re release a lot of insulin. So we have high sugar, high blood glucose, and high insulin. Now remember the role of insulin is to, to bring that glucose into the muscle, the fat, and the liver. Um, but when we have insulin resistance, so when you repeatedly do this, you repeatedly have these high, um, high a diet with a high amount of refined carbohydrates, the insulin resistance develops. The, the muscle, and this, particularly the liver and the muscle, start not recognizing that insulin. So the insulin cannot take the glucose out of the, out of the bloodstream. 
So now it gets in, it, we have a really high blood glucose. And remember I described it like the little boy who cried wolf. And if you have a little boy coming and knocking on your door and the first time he screams, you go, oh, I'll, I'll go out and see what happens. And then he giggles and runs away. Well, the next time he does it, you're less enthused. And by the third time, you don't even answer the door. By the fourth time, you don't even hear him knocking. Well, you've, you've become resistant, you know, to this uh, boy who's knocking. It's the same thing with the cells. If insulin comes knocking and keeps coming knocking like, hey, 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 let me in, eventually the cells are like, nope, I'm not going to listen to you anymore. So the cells, particularly the muscle and the liver, no longer really have a response to that insulin. So there's a very slow process of that, of that glucose being moved out of the cells. Very hard to get it into the muscle. Unfortunately, it does promote fat storage. So you end up having more fat storage because insulin promotes fat storage. You have less glucose in the muscle. So the muscle wants to have energy to do activity, but it doesn't. So the, that individual who has insulin resistance does not have energy to exercise. They're consuming this food and they're storing it as fat. So we, you know, we try to think of this calories in, calories out theory. Well, yeah, the calories are going in and they're going somewhere, but they're not being utilized for what we need them to be utilized for. And what happens is you end up uh, driving down the blood sugar. So the muscle doesn't have the glucose. The blood sugar drops. Of course, we're going to you know, stimulate hunger this way without having a low blood sugar. We're going to store more fat. So again... People are eating, but they can't utilize that energy to do the things that they want to do. So this is where the hormonal balance comes in, driving somebody to eat, but not being able to utilize those nutrients for what, um, the activities that we want. Now I'm going to go to fructose, because fructose actually has an, in, um, an independent effect. Now, we think of refined carbohydrates, and of course, that's all of our starch-based uh, foods, most of the refined grains, and um, our products like our you know, breakfast cereals. Now, fructose, um, whether it is added from any type of added sugar, whether it is honey, whether it's organic cane sugar, high fructose corn syrup, just sucrose, any of those things that have fructose in them, you're going to get a huge dose of fructose that goes to the liver. Now, what's interesting about fructose is that our body really doesn't need it. We need glucose. We're just getting it in way too high of doses too quickly, too soon, and that causes a hormonal um, that causes a hormonal imbalance. With fructose, we're getting these large doses of fructose from this, these processed foods, and the cells can't use fructose. At least with glucose, every cell can use glucose for energy before insulin resistance. <laughs> but with fructose, the cells really can't use it, so fructose goes right to the liver. Now, the liver gets overloaded with these high doses of fructose coming from processed foods with, with added sugar. And the liver ends up making fat and storing fat and getting loaded up with fat within the liver, packaging it up, sending it out as fat into the bloodstream as well. Uh, and there are a few other um, processes that happen, such as increase in, in uric acid and depletion of the energy in, in the liver. But it has this independent effect that you know, more research needs to be done, but could be an independent factor for contributing to obesity. So it's definitely part of this process of obesity and with causing hormonal imbalances. What I need to think of as these hormonal imbalances actually end up driving our behavior. And I forgot something. Fructose causes uh, insulin resistance in the liver. So that's what really contributes to the hormonal imbalance. Now, Hormones really drive behavior. We're going to go over behaviors as far as appetite controls and hunger uh, next. But these hormone, hormones drive behaviors. For example, um, insulin will actually help control satiety. So even though we have these high doses of insulin when we eat, uh, say, a starch-based meal, at least insulin is going to signal the brain and say, hey, there's food. Stop eating. With fructose, we don't get that. Um, but... These do drive behaviors, and when you have these behaviors, it's going to cause a food-seeking behavior to consume more food, usually more of the bad foods, the refined carbohydrates, the added sugars, uh, all the processed foods, and this contributes to people becoming larger.
Now, the next thing I want to discuss is how a calorie is not a calorie. Um, we think about, you know, if we look at fat, protein, carbohydrate, that no matter the calories that we get them are going to be the same, and a calorie is a calorie. It all goes in the same bin because it's just a unit of energy. But what happens from that calorie of energy you're consuming to what happens once it gets in the body is very different. So I want you to know that a calorie is not a calorie. And remember that both carbohydrates and proteins provide four calories per gram. So that's when they're going into the body, you know, they would have the potential to give us four calories of energy, whereas fat is almost double that, so that would be nine calories per gram. And that's why, you know, especially back in the 80s, it was all the low-fat diets were the big fad, and we wanted to avoid fat because um, we thought it was so energy dense. But when you consume carbohydrates and fat, the body is very efficient at utilizing these for energy. So we can break down the carbohydrates, break down the fats, and if we need them for energy, it's very easy to do that. Protein, not so much. Protein is not an efficient source of energy. So even though it might start with four calories per gram, maybe you get that in a lab, it gets into the body. Remember how complex protein is? Um, to, to break that down, to actually break it into its individual components to get those two carbon fragments and to make that into energy? That takes energy to do that. So the net effect of getting energy from protein um, ends up being very small. So we're definitely not getting four calories per gram. And that's when we look at this as the thermic effect of food. If you're going to eat more uh, foods that are higher protein content, uh, you're going to have spend more energy digesting and absorbing and metabolizing and utilizing that as a source of energy compared to a diet of very high refined carbohydrates, such as bread. And also, we don't want to use protein for energy. Remember all those functions? I mean, we've got skin to make and ligaments and tendons and muscles and enzymes and antibodies, and it's, it's for buffers and fluid balance. A lot of things protein can do besides give us energy. And we all have a nice little store of fat. That's a great source of energy. And then we have carbohydrates, a very easy and efficient source of energy. So this is why a calorie isn't a calorie, and how you actually can increase energy expenditure by changing the composition of your diet. Um, and we'll talk about how the hormonal influences of these foods in a little bit, but it's just as far as having more protein in the diet compared to refined carbohydrates. And I know we went through our protein chapter, and I said, you don't need that much protein. Um, and it's true, you definitely don't need that much protein, but having that protein base will definitely increase energy expenditure as far as the thermic effect of food is concerned.